Welcome, everybody. You are tuned into the Melting Spot podcast, the podcast for everyone and anyone. And today I am here with one of the best educators I've had in my life, a fantastic keyboardist and an overall great person, great person, Sir Howie Gordon. How have you been, Howie? I have. You have. Yeah, exactly. And you're just saying that stuff because it's true. But, you know, it's fine. Uh, yeah. No, I, I'm strictly lying on my introductions <laughs> you should know that i say everything that i feel the opposite of in my introductions um i know you visited italy over the break and i've gotten the impression over the years that traveling is something that you value and so i was going to ask if you could tell me a little bit about what traveling means for you and do you have any places that you could potentially recommend to me to visit because that's something i'd like to do more going forward sure uh camden is lovely this time of year i you know <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's funny. Traveling is not something that I used to do so much when I was younger, but um, my wife travels for work all the time, and I started to uh, tag along with her in, in some of these things, and I stopped for a while when our son was... It was easy when he was like, you know, one or two years old, but like, you know, when he was younger, it became very difficult. Uh, yeah. So I, did, I didn't do it for a long time. Um, and now, you know, he's 22 now. So now I can kind of just, it's a little easier. Yeah. Um, but he actually, he joined us for a week. We were in Rome um, and he joined us for a week and it was quite amazing uh, in terms of, you know, our country is so young. I mean, you know, I walk down that the street is, and it's history everywhere it's crazy. you go. Yeah, I, you you went la- last year too as well. Am I wrong? Yes. I, that you sent me a. I want to say you sent me a picture from Beethoven's original, Mozart's house. Mozart's one of yeah. one of Mozart's apartments. Yeah. Was, uh, yeah. So we were in Austria for a little bit, and then we went to the Amalfi Coast, which was quite lovely. Um, and then this year we were in Rome. And, yeah, you walk down the road and there's, like, walls that are from 300 A.D. Yeah. And you just go up and touch them. And it's really, really cool. And then, the, you know, the, the, the marble work is unbelievable. The, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the chapels and, the, and the, uh, the churches and everything. Um, having said that – oh, and then we went to Florence for a few days, oh, which was nice. lovely too. Um, I would say, uh, yeah – if you can go to really anywhere, really, but Europe is fantastic. Um, northern parts of Italy would be okay. my first recommendation. Have you ever seen the Alps? No. My wife's gone there. I have not. Does she recommend? Yeah, that's, she said that's it's beautiful. That's been high on my list. I, I, yeah. I, I daydream about the Alps constantly because it just looks so beautiful. And um, Yeah, she's been there. I have not. She's been a bunch of places I have not. Oh, what and again, what does she do again? I know she's a cognitive neuroscience researcher, so she's wicked smart. Yeah, Um, she does a lot of stuff dealing with mapping parts of the brain and what their function um, is. So, um, and she works a lot with stroke patients. So when a part of the brain no longer is active due to stroke, they can do mapping. They can do fMRI mapping. And, you know, they'll have someone in, a, in an fMRI tube and they'll give them a task and they'll see what parts of the brain light up. And they'll see with stroke patients what parts of the brain no longer function. Uh, so basically what her research goes towards is helping develop um, therapies for this stuff. She doesn't necessarily work with patients directly directly. Yeah. Um, on the therapy end of things, 
she works on the end of things that figures out what the brain does so that therapies can be wow. derived from that. And she's, you know, she's always she's got several different things going on. And one of them is like um, she's doing this uh, this VR thing with um, phantom limb patients, which is wow. really, really, really cool. So there, you know, so when you like, so if you have an amputation, right, if you um, if your left leg is amputated, mm -hmm. um, what can happen is since the nerves are no longer there yeah. to send information back to the brain, the brain will interpret sometimes this missing information as pain. So people will, you know, even if they don't have half their leg they'll feel like an enormous pain in what where their leg would be because the brain just doesn't know how to interpret the mismatched signals. So what they used to do is something called mirror therapy where they would put ah, a mirror. I've seen videos of this. Okay, yeah. right, right, right. Yeah. So if they put a mirror and you lift your right leg, then you see what would be in the space of your left leg moving. Yeah. But now um, with VR, uh, see the problem with mirror therapy is it's not independent. Yeah. Like you move your right leg and the left leg, the the fake left leg always moves with the right leg. So with VR, they can actually um, have in their in their Oculus, um, what do you call it, the, the headset, the whatever. The, yeah, yeah. I've never actually tried it. But, uh, you know, if they move um, what's remaining of their leg, they can they can activate muscles and then the 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 VR headset will move a fake left leg in the VR world. That's a, a phantom pain is such a like mind boggling thing to think of. I had my wisdom teeth taken out a mm -hmm. few months ago and I've actually been dealing with phantom tooth pain. It feels like that wisdom tooth is still there and I'm getting the same sort of feeling from when they were still there. I, I had to go mm -hmm. to my, my doctor and everything and figure out what it was because I, I thought it was getting infected or something and you literally you feel the tooth there. And then I put my tongue like back there and try to feel it. And it's not there. It's, it's a weird, weird phenomenon. And it's like, it's so, it, it's hard to understand, but the limb stuff seems even crazier. Yeah. It's really cool. Um, to pivot real quick. Cause that was, <laughs> that was a nice little tangent. We just went on there, but, um, I wanted to ask, this is something I've kind of tried to ask staff that I've had on this show. How, how did you get started at Monco? And was teaching something you had always pictured yourself doing in life, or did that kind of just come naturally? Uh, it, in regards to the teaching thing, no, that was not necessarily a goal. Mm. Um, I always just wanted to perform, and I my degrees are in performance, not in education. Um, and it just it just happened, like. Um, before I even actually had students, I was tutoring other students at UArts in, um, well, in, 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 in a lot of MIDI and recording stuff. Okay. Um, so it was not required for us to take, there were classes specifically on MIDI because, you know, back then MIDI and audio were two totally separate animals. Yeah, they're, they're, and they really had their, their divisions. They yeah. were not, it, the overlap that we now see was not there. Yeah. So, you know, I took MIDI courses because it was a keyboard player and I always, it was, I already, I already had experience going, you know, with that before I went to school. So I was taking that and then we were required to take a recording class at, at, at eight in the morning, mind you. Which is, you know, if you want a bunch of jazz musicians to learn something about how a recording studio works, yeah, 8 o'clock in the morning is exactly when you want them to take that class. Michael Kelly. <laughs> I'll never forget getting, <laughs> getting up at... I was no, finally graduate high school. I'll never have to wake up at 6 a.m. ever again. Michael Kelly. Michael Kelly. Yeah. Thank you, though. Learned a lot. Well, hey, you know, that means he's out of the room for the time when I need the room. So <laughs> yeah. thanks, Mike. Yeah, he, he, he did me a solid. If there's one thing about Michael Kelly, he, he gets in, does his job well, yeah. gets out. Okay, pumpkin. Oh. But uh, It was the best one. We had the mask on, and his, his voice was even more so how it is with the mask because yeah, yeah. it's covered up a little bit. What a great so dude. anyway, sorry. Long. It's a, I'm giving you a long-winded answer. So basically, I, I was already tutoring people in in you know in that stuff because mm -hmm. all the class just you know 
was just hating life. <laughs> and I was like, all right, guys, it's look, it's not that complicated. It's yeah. just here's the deal. So um, and then I just started picking up a couple of students. And then at some point, um, a really good friend of mine um, and one of the most unbelievable guitarists, musicians, like mind-numbingly good. Uh, his name is Eric Sales. He's a Philly guy. Um, he had a school called Music Workshop. And he was like, hey, I need a piano teacher. I was like, okay, well, why not? And and I just it just clicked. It, there you go. And that was it. And, it. and it just totally clicked. That's awesome. And if you've never seen Eric Sales play, good Lord. Well, if he if he ever does a show or anything with you, I've been trying. I want to get a time to go out to one of yours, but I'd love to get a chance to see that. Because it, if it's you complimenting somebody and the way I view you as a performer and teacher and everything, I, I there's it's a must see. Oh, dude, Eric's a whole other stratosphere. Like his head's on another planet. I, you know, he's he's one of you know. It's like everyone has their skill level. Yeah. And then there's that other level where all the pro musicians are just like, I don't want to take a solo after that guy. Yeah, he's one of those. Mm -hmm. That that's there's a lot of things like I, comedians talk about that a lot. Where they talk about the having to follow somebody who right. absolutely just destroyed and like yeah, we need those people though. I think they help us keep a keep. Oh, I yeah. mean, I and this is more for me because I view definitely you are more experienced and developed than anything I got going on. But I need people like you and that to kind of keep me in check and keep me working. You know what I mean? Because it it is the the perfect example of that. There's always somebody out there working harder and always doing a bigger something fish. better. Always. Um, so just to go back even a little further, how did your journey with music begin? I know you've mentioned that you went to jazz school when you were younger, mm -hmm. uh, but that's about all the Howie lore that I'm privy to. Uh, I was forced to take piano lessons. I had no choice in the matter. Okay. I was forced to take piano lessons when I was around six and a half, somewhere around there. That'll do it. Yeah. In fact, actually, the, the guy's the guy's house is uh well, he doesn't live there anymore, but um he lived on uh, on Stenton. He was like he's like five minutes from here. Really? Yeah. Actually, I pass his house on the way to work. That's got to be kind of like a cool like full circle thing. Like, yeah, it's weird. Yeah, I pass every time I and and I look up the driveway. I'm like every every single time I, I pass his house on the way awesome. to work. I'm like ah, eh, there's um and then you know and you know I didn't want to. Just had no interest. I'm like, no, don't want to do it. Um, and then at the end of the lesson, uh, he had a you know, a jar of jelly beans. <laughs> so he gave me jelly beans. Kept you going. And it kept me going. <laughs> and what's ridiculous is like, you know, it wasn't until I was around like 20 years old that I figured I'm like, damn it, I could have just bought some jelly beans. <laughs> and I wouldn't have had to do those lessons. Yeah. Do you think there was part of you that wanted the challenge more so than the jelly beans? You're missing the point. The point is the jelly beans, I could have just, I mean, they're not expensive, right? Yeah. I could have just, and then like all that time in lessons just wasted. So jelly beans are a, a canon event that led you here, kind of, I guess. I guess so, yeah. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> jelly beans. Um do you do you ever get done sessions now and you like just start itching like I need some jelly beans like, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I like that you you did this yeah <laughs> yeah I practice it yeah good. Um, <laughs> next question uh, no <laughs> this is a random one um, <laughs> I, w especially or um, I know we got the keys room set up in here and everything I don't think those are all the schools correct. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so what is I, – I know you're a fantastic keys player. What is oh, your – Oh, stop it. I have More. to. More. What is your favorite synthesizer slash keyboard instrument of all time? Oh, and duh. in your opinion, why are keys the coolest musical instrument? Oh, well, they are, clearly. I, I mean, agree. You know, why – why why anything? Um, no, what is, what is it? Favorite? You know, the, 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 the problem with answering that question mm -hmm. 
I want your personal biased view, 100 percent biased. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the thing for someone like me who, uh, you know, ADD coupled with uh, a massively short attention span. What are we doing here? Oh, a seagull. Anyway, uh, seagull. Yeah. No, like someone with a very short attention span. That's why uh, keyboards were um, attractive to me, because, you know, whatever your mood was, you could jump to, you know, one thing or the other. Yeah. It wasn't you weren't stuck. You were all, there was always some other sonic option. And honestly, you know, there were times that I was really enjoying piano lessons and there were times that I was just like, ugh, you know, yeah. don't want to do this. Um, and, 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 and if keyboards weren't involved, it was, it was just straight piano. I don't think I would have stuck yeah. with it. I mean, now having said that, I mean, I love a good piano. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's absolute magic. Like the piano is magic, but you know, so is a Rhodes. So is a mini Moog. So is a Hammond organ. So is a clav. So is a this, so is a that, you know, they're all magic in their own way. Yeah. So it's just, you know. If there if there's one thing I, I desire to get my hands on greatly, it is a mini Moog at home. Because any time I step in that room and start just twisting knobs and having fun, like one, I learn something. Two, I just have so much fun, and you get so locked in. Like you can literally be not even recording, just sitting there messing, like going like boop 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 yeah. for thirty minutes, and you'll totally lose yourself. And it's it's encapsulating as hell. Um, Years of my life. Spent can, doing that. I can only imagine. Years. <laughs> I can. But, but, you know, and, and you're hitting on something also, like, that's, you know, important. I mean, one of the reasons that, you know, the mini Moog and, and those type of synths are, are so expressive is because you, you know, you're not using a mouse. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, the mouse is a wonderful invention, but it's also the worst thing you could possibly do in terms of being expressive. It's, I've said it before, it's like, it's like accessing the entire world with one finger at a time mm -hmm. and only this finger. Like, yes. you know, like, you know, aside from your face and your voice, your fingers are like the most expressive things you have. That was I, that was so well said the way you just said that, because I've I try in a, like this is something I've come to learn more as I I don't really play any instruments well. But as I, I get better at creating and facilitating my own creation almost feels as if that like that mu music and everything it's always out there existing and like floating around but it's the fingers and everything that we can like reach out and grab it and make it come to life and everything and I don't that that kind of helps connect things in my head the way you said that the fingers are it, we're, it's one step away from everything in the world you know what I mean yeah that's how you interface with most things I mean until you plug a cable into your head yeah you're using these so like you know the thing about a mini mug is like you can play and turn the knobs and treat it like an instrument yeah it's expressive versus this is cool but hold on let me move the mouse pointer to that thing and then click the button and then drag up and down I mean come on it's like, not. It's it's it it's it's totally different, and it's totally like it, even if you take like a, a a VST replica of like a Moog or something, like you can't twist that knob with your hand while you're doing. I mean, you can if you're super good and have like the craziest carpal tunnel of all time. <laughs> and but like twisting a knob, hearing something, like doing that, it's it's even with analogs like the board and everything. That's 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 such a big takeaway from like recording and music in general is like doing that stuff where you're twisting and hands on and it's it, it's totally different and it really expands your like view of everything i think yeah mixing with a mouse is terrible yeah. i mean you know like putting your fingers on a fader and moving them in time with the music yeah. you can actually you know you can move your body with the music and play it yeah you yeah. know if you need to ride a vocal you can play that mm -hmm. you know with a mouse i mean ugh. You're going to get it smooth for a few seconds, and then at some point you're going to be like, eh. and then It's the worst. And then you try, and then you have to write it all in, and the automation. You know, you know and if anyone's shit. listening to this and, and doesn't understand this, if they're not musicians, just think of this. You know, try and use a mouse to sign your name on the screen. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it looks like, you know. It's a good example. It looks terrible. Yeah. You ever have to do like one of those like e doc things and you like, yes, it looks like shit. It's awful every time. 
So yeah, now imagine doing anything else artistic. It, it stinks. Um, but you know, and 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 I have to pay you a compliment at this point. And this is something that that I've always noticed about you is that you're you think a lot about the process. You you have always consistently thought about the way that you do things, and I think that's what what you know has made you. Um, incredibly good at this because you're you. you're not just oh I'm mean, come on you earned it dude you, you know from and from early on you know, tear <laughs> that, that's a happy tear right there no, but I that, mean like from means, early on you can see that you think about it it's not just oh do this do this do that it's like you you have always thought about the why and the how and yeah. like you know and it was obvious in the questions that you started asking early on mm -hmm. like you 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 know, and it's those questions that mm -hmm. that's what's going to serve you and has served you and will continue to serve you. I think it, it even as a necessity, I think I've kind of had to do that because I didn't like you mentioned, you had been playing piano since you were six. And I like that was always a part of your life. And for for me, it was I spent a lot of my younger life and like high school and everything just like picking stuff up and drying it out and putting it down and never really like sticking with anything i didn't quite have anyone telling me like hey you need to do this you need to practice this you need to i did a lot of burning my hand on the stove by myself <laughs> you know what i mean and i had to learn that way and i probably did it two or three more times than most kids do but it, i it's the things like that that kind of help me f have really helped me find my place more so you know like I, and you know when i started i like I wanted to do lessons, I wanted to make beats, I wanted to engineer, I wanted to do all these things, and, like, this has really helped me, The and the, the way I kind of look at things helped me, it feels like, find my place more, which is nice. And I owe credit to you and the building and all the people who have taught me things. And it kind of ties into my question here. Um, aside from all the technical knowledge that I've gotten from your teaching, one of the most important things that I've learned from you revolves around character and mindset. And I came into SRT ex extremely nervous and overwhelmed and fearful that, like, I didn't have what it took, wh whatever it is. Um, but the, the genuine example that you always gave off, it, it really helped me develop my own confidence and to be myself unapologetically. And, and it, it felt like a lot of guessing up to that point until now. And so for one, thank you, but... Two, how have you personally, if you have, I'm sure everyone has, but if you're willing to share, how have you managed any feelings of self-doubt or not self-hatred, but that kind of mindset throughout your career? How have you conquered those kind of things? Ooh. That's a hard, I know, it's a, a lot to unpack. Um, very wordy also, I apologize. Well, you know... And that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> How's that for an answer? You guys heard it here. Well, you know. It honestly, and it's funny, <laughs> I know you're joking, but it really, I think it is something that is different for everybody. You know yeah. What I mean, I mean self-doubt, I mean, you know, everyone has, has self-doubt. That, that. That can be a very he healthy thing. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, the. Um, well, I think it, it can help you to focus on like that. That self doubt can be the 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 thing that says, okay, well, what am I doubting? Okay, well, then that's the thing. Like, what am I afraid of? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, then that's the thing. I better get off my ass and practice. Yeah, you know, it's like, and and musically. If you have a passage that you're just, like, afraid of, right, like, okay, I'm fine until we get to the second page. And then when that phrase starts there, man, that's, I'm terrified of that. Well, then that becomes your thing that, you know, that fear turns into, like, okay, well, I need to really work the hell out of that. And if you can use that just as informational type of directive mm -hmm. to say, like, well, let's turn the fear into something logical and useful. Yeah. And then you can work on it. Then that passage 
can and often does become the most exciting part of the piece. Yeah. This is the thing you look forward to. Like, I was watching this this interview. Um, Mike Tyson has this interview show called Hot Box. Hot Box. That's yeah. a great one. It's fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah, that dude has, uh, like... Talk about character development. Oh, man. Man, 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 man. What a just phenomenal person. So um, he was, I think it was him and William Shatner. Oh, wow. And... And he said something about like a lot of young boxers, a lot of young fighters walk around saying like, I'm not afraid of anything. I don't have any fear. And he said something to the extent of that's really stupid. And he said, he went on to say, fear is our friend. Like you have to understand the nature of fear. Absolutely. And he said, fear is like fire. You know, if you let it get out of control, you know, it'll burn everything down around you and everything. It'll take away everything you love. Yeah. It's like, but if you learn how to deal with it and learn how to control it, he's like, f- you know, he said fire can warm you. It can cook your food. Yeah. It can sustain you. That is a, God, man, Mike Tyson, he's right? good, dude. He's good, dude. He's it's good. It's fantastic. And I've used, I've played that video uh, for the past several semesters when people ask mm-hmm. about stage fright because I, I've often gotten that question. Yeah. Like, how do you not get stage fright? And what do you mean? How do you not? You, of course, you like always. It doesn't go away. I, I I really think that is something that, and not and not just in music. I know it started with the music here, but that is a skill that like I've noticed applies to all aspects of life. It applies yeah. to relationships with other people. It applies at the workplace. It, it applies in music and your your passion and it. It's kind of what I was touching on when I say burn your hand on the stove. If you burn your hand on the stove, it, not too much because then you'll have nerve damage and then you'll just be fucked up. You yeah, I wouldn't recommend that. it. No, yeah. no. It's but not. like you do it a healthy amount, you learn it. I, I don't know. It's like going into something with no fears is blindly going into something, I think, and results in you falling much harder and, and feeling the negative effects of failure much harder. But if you embrace failure... That's really the moments where you learn and you develop and, you know, once you go into, once you burn your hand, you don't, you usually don't do it again. You know, it's usually a moment where you grow and you step forward. So I I really like how you worded that. And if if there's something you're struggling with or scared of, it's probably the thing you should go head in on and and do your best to conquer because then it, it won't fester. It won't sit inside of you. It won't like, I think of when. Especially when I first started here, I was so scared to go up to the SSL every single time. It just all the buttons and everything. I I was so scared I was just gonna somehow do something wrong that would light the room on fire. You know, like just catastrophizing. I said that word wrong in my head, but um, it's right. We can edit that out. Yeah, it, I mean, I get you. You learn how to do that on the on the the first assignment. That yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the radio edit. Oh my gosh. That is du- that is paying dividends now. Yeah, you have no idea. That is paying serious dividends now. I I feel like I'm a podcast editing, m- not master, but I'm pretty quick with it at this point. Which, by the way, I don't know if you've seen what the current state of this is. Um, there is software out there. One of them, I think, is called Descript. I think. Mm. I, I I could have that name wrong. Yeah, but. Like, this is the state of this, um, where you record your podcast, mm-hmm. okay, and then it uses AI, and it listens to all the audio, and like Siri does, it transcribes all the words that you say, but then it ta- it tags those words to the, to the timestamps on the waveform, and it looks up all the times you say, uh, um... Oh, shit. Yes. Oh, God. And then what you can then do, you can actually, you know how like you do a find replace in yeah. like a Word doc? You mm-hmm. can literally do a find replace or any occurrence of uh and um. Wow. And it will search for them, remove them, and clip the audio out oh, automatically. That's almost phrase. scary to think about. Because w- one yeah. of the number one things I walked away from, especially my first episode with Matt, I realized how many times I go like, um... Like, 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 oh my God, I say like so much. Yeah. And it, it, that, those are the things that help me become a better interviewer through the few episodes I've done. But I, I like, just said like again, 
Well, nothing like hearing yourself, hearing a recording of yourself to realize, ugh. I'm not as good as I thought <laughs> I was at this. Like, I know it's, I'm a pretty good people person and talker, but this has really helped me tighten up my conversations and learn the flow of a conversation. Like, it, there, there are questions I want to get across, obviously, but I can't be a robot and just be like, here's this next question, answer. Okay, next question. Like, there it has to be fluidity to it if you want something quality out of it and if you want to gain something out of it, you know. I've only brought people I really feel like have impacted my life and helped me learn things that I, I don't know. I want to do it. It's due diligence, you know. Right, and, you know, when you hear that recording of yourself, is like it's one of the one of the best teachers, uh, you know. Oh, you it just listen sure to that and you're is. Like, Ugh. Even with the fear thing, I hear my voice and I'm like, oh, oh God. God. I sound it's awful. Terrible. I know. I don't um, mean your voice. I mean I hate I hate my yeah. voice. Um, I, but I, like I do, yeah, that hearing those recordings has definitely uh, made me very conscious of like when I when I'm in a class and I'm giving a lecture. Yeah. Of not doing that. Yeah. Um, I do hear. I I kind of told Quinn earlier that if I'm going over my time limit, um, to start playing on the Marshall Cab, which I don't know if they can hear through the mics, but they are 100% going on the Marshall Cab here. So I'm going to try and wrap this up real quick, but I wanted to ask Package Funk. You told me once before, but can you remind me where the name of the band came from and how you guys got started? Oh, uh, well, you know, we all were really, really big fans of the shipping industry <laughs> and uh, and cardboard products. And we really liked the idea that, like, you know, who doesn't get excited I love cardboard. When you see a package waiting for you. That's, ah. Uh, it's, it's exciting. Yeah. You know? Every time. Yeah. So you see that, you see that package and you're just like, man, I'm so excited. The yeah. package is here. You know? And that's what it's all about. I, I can't, I feel like there's definitely sarcasm here, but even if there isn't, that's. A, it, I can, f- it's, it's in the room. It's wafting away somewhere. In here. <laughs> Maybe there is. Maybe there isn't. Um, you decide. Stemming from that. Um, yeah, I, it's one of those things like, look, here's the deal. We write instrumental music. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's like one of those things where when we name songs, it's like, you know, what the hell do you call this thing? <laughs> I feel that a lot. I get right? that with almost everything that I make, I feel like. I never know what to name it. Yeah, I mean, when you write something with lyrics, it's really easy to name it. It's called the thing that you say most often in the song. That's yeah. what it's called. Yep. You know, or if you're if you want to do the thing that pisses off the record label, you know, you call it something that has, you know, you, you call it something that is maybe spoken once during one of the verses and not, the, you know, what the hook is, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, but, you know, it's like one of those things. What do we call stuff? So the name is just like, you know, a lot of times names are just like, they sound cool yeah. or we think it's funny or, you know, we're just like, what is this? What is this? What does this sound like? You know, we have to come up with some name to describe, yeah. uh, you know, you know, and, and, and it's not like when you have instrumental classical music, sometimes it follows a form, mm-hmm. right? So it's easy to say this is a minuet or this is a sonata yeah. or this is a this or this is a that because those things are specific forms. Like, in order to be a sonata, it has to have certain elements. In order to be a this, it has to have certain elements. Well, our stuff doesn't follow... uh, We use a lot of those techniques of compositional techniques, but none of our stuff follows a specific form. So we can't do that. We can't say, oh, this is a sonata, because it's not. So then it's a matter of, like, what the hell do you call this? Well, and I think... I, what I've noticed, even with the creation of, like, this podcast and everything, it felt like a very weird name. It was hard to, like, picture. It, it felt not very solid. But as you go forward with something, and the more you literally say the name and put the name on different things, it be, it almost works itself into being more real than it felt when you made it. Yeah. Like, uh, you, I know you made... Your logo, you made an actual replica of yeah. it, right? Like, I feel like that's yeah. one of those things that, like, makes the name of something like Package Funk, it makes it more real and it gives it more weight. And that's kind of, like, how it happens. It's very hard to come up with, like, that catchy name that everybody's going to like right away, you know? I think a lot of it 
it comes to em- embody what you're doing and like all the other things that go into the name that help it give it its color and everything. I don't, it, yeah, I mean, the, the, the when we first came up with the name, the logo was just a cardboard box with the word package on it, mm-hmm. you know? And then at some point, I was messing around in Photoshop and I had the idea of like, hey, it would be really hilarious if I make it look like a gramophone. Yeah. Right? With the crank handle yeah. and, the, and the horn up top, mm-hmm. you know, but it's still a box. So I did that all in Photoshop and that, that became the logo. We call it the Groovophone. Yeah. Um, and then at some point, it was during COVID, I was like... This is so cool. I was like, I want, I'm going to make a stage prop. <laughs> right? So I ordered a replica horn. Yeah. And I built the handle out of just some steel rod and, um, and a chunk of walnut. Yeah. Um, and basically, the box itself is a cardboard box, but it's actually... There's a reinforced wood frame on the inside yeah. that's right up against the cardboard because, you know, otherwise it could get damaged real easily. Um and so I was building it, and then at some point, it morphed into, this is the best. could we do something? <laughs> could we put lights in it? Could we make it animated? Could What could we do? And then... Fog machine? Yeah, we're like... <laughs> at, I don't know if... It, I think it was my idea, uh, or it might have been my bass player's idea. I, it's so... G- I don't know, but he and I were together, idea. and we're like... Dude, if it could shoot fog out the top. <laughs> so we started thinking like, okay, how could we do this and not set the thing on fire because fog machines run hot? Yeah. And I literally called B&H Photo, which is one of my, I love those guys. And I spoke to one of the guys on the, on the phone. I was like, listen, this is the stupid thing I want to do. <laughs> is it possible to channel the fog out of the, the fog machine through, uh, you know, and he, sa- and he said, yes, we've actually had Broadway productions that, do this and what you want to do. And he talked me through the whole thing. He's like, you get, you know, just use copper plumbing pipe, (laughs) you know? And he's like, you can get this inch adapter and then through to a, you know, through through a three quarter inch copper pipe and you can run it up. Yeah. Um, And I said, okay, but I want to contain it in a box. What about the, the airflow? And he's like, he's, and the, the overheating, he's like, it shouldn't be a problem, but you, what you can do is you can put a little computer fan, to blow air inside uh, to cool it out, yeah. you know, and that's the, that's it's got a little computer fan in the back. Yeah, it pulls outside air into the you know, and it cools the machine on the inside, and it also helps push the smoke out. That is so cool. So dude. yeah, I, I I'm I'm I, hopefully down the road. I you, if you don't mind, I'm I may do something not something similar with like the fog machine and everything, but I, I have a logo created that my brother made, and mm-hmm. I would love to get like. Either like an LED kind of sign or some physical like aspect of it that I could like plop right here or something to just you know. I know they got a uh, to to refer you to. We will. I will get that from you right after. There's this. an amazing, amazing musician uh, named Brian Fitzgerald, but everyone just calls him Fitzy. He's a violin player, electric violin player, yeah. uh, electric violin player, multi instrumentalist. Um, in fact, he is the guy who is responsible for our drummer being in the band. He recommended our drummer, Josh Orlando, to us. Really? Uh, so we owe him a great debt of gratitude. But he's also an electronics whiz, um, and he makes stuff like that. Oh, that's cool. And he actually was the – I built the Groovophone entirely myself except for one part of the wiring. I like the name for it. Also. Yeah, like and, and, and he was the one that helped me finish the electrical wiring because I kept getting shocked. <laughs> Every time I would hit the fog button, I would get jolted. And and after like three or four times of getting you know electrocuted, I was like, all right, I'm farming this part out. And Brian is the one that, that, that got it all working for me. My poor brother. I, you'll be watching this at some point, Nathan. That I – I think of my brother who's an electrician yeah. and all the stories he's told me over the past few months of just like going up to something, being ready for it, and then just like – and it catches you off guard completely. He, oh, yeah. It's it's getting, not fun. Getting shocked is not fun. Not fun. Not fun. And if you get it bad, it will mess you up for a few days. It's yeah. n- not fun. Um, but – being that we're approaching the end of the episode here, yeah, real I quick, on. I know I, I, I'm sorry for taking up so much of your it's time. It's all right. Here. It's all good. Um, is there any shows, personal work, uh, your social media handles, anything yeah, you can advertise? Yeah, Package Funk. Okay. On Instagram and YouTube. Um, hang on, I grab the calendar. And all of these will be tagged in links, descriptions, social media, and everything, so you guys can find it. Same thing for everybody I've interviewed. 
thus far? Uh, we are actually going to be in Maniunk at the end of August. But actually, we're doing uh, two recording dates coming up soon at this place called Least of All. It's Lista Vol. L-E-E-S-T-A, second word, V-A-L-L. So least of all, they do this thing where you record direct to vinyl. Wow. Yeah, it's going to be fun. So, you know, bruises and all. It's, it's you know, we're going to do each recording is an individual event. I mean, you know, we're recording through microphones and real gear. Yeah. But it's going direct to vinyl. Now, really quick, can you just explain that signal flow of how you're getting to the disc from that? Like, at it, it, this is happening in real time? It's real time. It's printed onto the vinyl while you play? As far as I know. Wow. I did not even know that was a possibility. Uh, I, as far as I, know, were... I could be wrong. I, I got to be honest. I really don't know how how it works. Yeah. I'm not. I'm, I, I, yeah, I'm really not sure of the, the, the technical specifications of how they do it. But I'm pretty sure they just take our signal out right into the lathe real that time. That is cool. But, you know, again, I, 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 I don't entirely yeah. know, but we're doing two dates. Like, um, so what happens is you pre-order the session. Yeah. Um, and then you go up there and you, you cut the recordings and you fill the orders. So we, we sold out of our first, we oversold yeah, the first one. Yeah, you had one. to add seats, right? Yeah. So we're, we're doing a second date and everyone gets a uniquely customized recording. We'll say, hey, this recording is going out to blah, blah, blah. Oh, wow. That's so cool. Like old time, you like recording an Edison cylinder. Well, I mean, I guess if it works in reverse, like you can sample something from a vinyl. Like I don't see how there wouldn't be a way to reverse that process. Although I know it's not the exact same. But with that being said, I want to wrap it up. Let Quinn get to his guitar. Let you get to what you got going on and everybody else. Um, thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you, Howie, for being here. My thank pleasure. You, Dalton. Joey is still in here from the, the interview earlier. Thank you to him. Thank you to Brom. Thank you to everybody. This has been The Melting Spot. I'm Isaiah, your host, Howie Gordon. Thank you, everyone. Have a good one.